Okay, good morning, gentlemen. Today's class is on compression. This is the first class on compression. Um, and I'm going to go over a couple of concepts of compression. <clears throat> I'm going to start with a nice video from our friend Gregory Scott and his take and explanation on how to listen for compression. And then the conversation is going to switch to how I process and think of compression, and then going into an actual session and then putting that concept into practice. Okay, so compression, what would be you guys' definition on compression? For me, it would kind of be like a kind of squeezing down the audio down in a way or kind of, it's more like the way the waveform impacts like between you mess with i know there's attack delay um the envelope and what's the last the other one release release with a r yeah i know between those it's i think the goal in the end is to kind of you know, not limit, but compress the waveform, like squeeze it down. So it's not a, so it's the loud parts may sound, some loud parts may sound quieter and those quieter parts, if you wanted to, could get them to sound louder in a way or proceed as right. louder. And, and right there, yeah. you're hitting on the textbook um, dictionary definition of what a compressor does, an audio compressor. It makes louder things softer, softer things louder yeah right and, yeah and, and that tends to be how everybody associates everything and and because of that definition that's how everybody uses a compressor okay um how about i continue with my proposal that i mentioned to you guys and i started this proposal in the eq lecture if you understand how to use an eq and a compressor in the deeper sense, you can use an equalizer to affect dynamics, and you can dynamics. use a compressor to affect tone. You use compressor as a tone shaper. Yeah. And I know those things sound opposite. They sound backwards, yeah. Right. But I remember you saying you, you prefer it that way, or to you, that's how you apply it, right? Right. I mean, I, yeah. I apply it in, in both worlds. Oh, I, okay. I apply a compressor as a dynamic processor, but I also use compression as a tone shaping because they fit under both at the same time. Um, or I might just use it a compressor for one thing versus uh, versus another. I might put a compressor on something not because I feel like something needs to be held within place and and constricted but more of the fact that there's going to be a tonal benefit to that instrument by having the compressor on that that may or may not be a dynamic adjustment adjustment yeah okay um okay because i can i might set up a compressor as more of a transparent thing or you may listen to it and you're like i don't necessarily hear that dynamic compression happening but it sounds better. How we, how that gets applied has everything to do with it. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, two for the price of one. Say that again. Two for the price of one. Yes. Yeah. Two for price. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That. That. To me. Um, to me, as an engineer, and as a mixing engineer, it is literally all about knowing and understanding your tools and maximizing your tools. And, and the more you can kind of get out of this box of EQ is for tone shaping, compression is for dynamic control, um, the more you realize there's so many ways around enhancing a mix and enhancing a song and adding to the performance and the emotion of it. And this class is very much a introduction to to mixing concepts and all the way from like a beginner to a intermediate level um but i really want to create a nice foundation for you guys in this class that from here 
you can keep developing these tools, practicing out things, and then get a wider understanding of these tools so then you can develop yourselves in whatever direction you want to when you get out of this class. But within this class, um, expose you to concepts and give you enough critical listening situation for you to start processing and understanding that, okay? So let's start with Gregory Scott's approach to an understanding of, of what compression is and how to listen to compression. You know, I, I keep going to his videos and what I found so interesting and odd at the same time is that anytime I watch one of his videos and he explains things, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's exactly how I visualize and I think of whatever that concept is and I do things the exact same way he does. So it's just gotten me to a point where if he can explain it better than I can, let me just put that, uh -huh. um, put that as part of the process here and in class. And then we, I just add my two cents to that and then build from there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, this guy's great. I feel like he explains everything very easy for someone to comprehend Yes. his videos. I, I, I agree. Okay, so let's start with this video. Just put a thumbs up on your screen to make sure that you're hearing it. Simple squashing a signal or holding a vocal in place or gluing things together. You start to think of compression as texture and vibe and movement. You get into compression more as an art form, as a way to manage density and transient and movement that's when things really start to get fun with compressors but before you can do that you gotta learn how to hear it. welcome to kush after hours my name is gregory scott tonight i'd like to do something hopefully very different for you than other stuff that you've seen maybe on youtube and other places other sources of audio information I would like to open up a session on a mix that I just finished and solo out the drums and something else for context and then show you how to hear compression, specifically on the drum bus. So for those of you who are new to this channel or don't know me at all and you're wondering, who is this ass clown and why is he going to teach me how to hear compression? I design compressors and EQs and distortion boxes, both in the analog and the digital world. Kush Audio is my company. All this brown gear back here, these are all my creations. These plugins here, these are all my creations. And I'm also a musician and a composer. I've been doing that for over 20 years. I've been designing this crap for over 10. I'm not here to tell you I'm an authority. I'm not here to tell you that I'm a great mixer, a great producer, songwriter, any of that stuff. That's what you think of my art is your business, not mine. But I can tell you that when I reach for a compressor and I adjust the attack from 100 microseconds to 400 microseconds, I can hear that. And now, whether or not you like what I do with that, that's a different question, right? But I can hear it. And I would like for you to be able to hear it too, because the more you can hear these things, by definition, the more options you have for your own productions, whether you're a mixer for hire or an artist doing this in your own bedroom. So, there are a few tricks to learning to hear exactly what all these little nuances of compression do. And I'm going to exaggerate to cartoonish levels some of the things that I'm doing. Again, this is because I'm not telling you how to compress things. I just want you to be able to hear exactly what the attack knob does on a compressor. And not just like hearing what it does, but maybe understanding what the textures are, what emotional qualities this brings to your productions. I could yammer on all night about this stuff, but let's get to it. Let's open up some sounds. Just for your edification, this is the sound of the production. to your taste at all but i think most of you would probably agree that the drums let me just pull up these drums here and drums on the Rhodes piano i think most of you would agree that these sound good they may not be the sound that you want but they sound good the high frequencies 
They're smooth. They're silky, even. That's a trick. I get that sound in large part because it's running out through this gear back here. My drums always go through these first four pieces of gear in the rack. And I'll talk in the future about what my settings are and how I use this stuff and why. But for now, just know these drums are in pretty good shape. So again, the point here is to not show you how to compress these drums. It's to use a good sounding source and bend it so that you can hear what the compressor does and maybe start to get a sense of why you would want to use the various settings on the compressor to achieve emotional, textural, and movement kind of effects. So let's start off with the attack. And specifically, let's get into the attack and hearing what's called transient control, packing those transients in. Transient is the initial burst of sound on a waveform, so when you hit a cymbal or you hit a drum, that initial of sound is called the transient, and the compressor really gives you an astonishing amount of control over the size and the speed and even the texture and the, the tone of that transient. So let's start off here with the drums, and I'm going to bury them inside the roads, meaning I'm going to turn the drums way down until they're like undermixed inside the roads. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that, but the main one is that compression especially shaping the attack, is really easy to hear at low volume. That's true when talking about the source being at a low volume in relation to other sounds in the mix. It's also true with the volume of your mix that you're listening to in the room. So here's a little pro tip for you. When you're learning about compression, especially things like mix bus compression or drum bus compression, where you can really whack out a transient, and you're not sure what's going on, turn the volume of your mix in the room that you're listening to. Turn it down so quiet that you can barely hear it. And then play with the attack knob on the compressor on your mix or on the drum bus or both. And you, you should be able to hear at that super quiet volume what that attack knob is doing. That's, that's different than knowing what to do with what you're hearing, but at least the first step is being able to hear this crap. So let's get into the drums here. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dial up some what we call generous compression. Alright, I'm gonna speed up the release a little bit here for demonstration purposes. We call this a fast-ish release. Uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 milliseconds I consider fast. Let's let all the transient through. Alright, so that's very compressed. Turn this way down. Okay. At this point, all you're hearing pretty much is the transient on these drums. That initial burst of sound coming through the compressor before it clamps down. Now I'm going to speed the attack up and let's just listen to what happens to the sound of the drums. There's very little sound coming through now. If I go even faster, transient left here, right, compared to this. Right. So that's the first thing that your ear needs to understand with compression, is exactly what the attack knob is doing to your transient, because a common beginner mistake, we'll call it, is to have too much transient and to overmix it, to mix it too loud in the mix, and so you get these really it's sort of a viscerally powerful feeling or sounding thing, but what happens is your drums are just too loud in the mix. And when you listen outside of the studio, you lose the power of the music itself. So you got these big, thwacky drums, but nothing else is really happening in the mix that's interesting. And most people don't really care about big, thwacky drums. They want to feel the power of the music of the song. So getting an ear for the attack and transient is crucial. And the great way to do that is to turn your sound way down when you're shaping the attack. All right, so I would call this a snappy transient. Versus like a 
riff wacky. It's a very punchy sound. So we start thinking about textures. Attack is a way to shape the punch and the attitude of the sound on the front edge. The brightness. When you let less sound through like that on the initial burst, the sound sounds mellower. You can bury a sound deeper in the mix when you have just enough of the right kind of pop coming through on the front edge of the sound. The ear tunes into that and knows the sound exists. And sometimes that's all you need is to just kind of remind the listener the sound exists. It's not the focus, it's not the point, but it's keeping time, it's dancing away in the background, it's doing something. So this is a tool in your toolkit to use. So now that we've talked about at the attack as a form of transient management and punch. Let's talk about it as a texture specifically. Let's turn the sound back up so that we can really hear. And then let's talk about hardness versus softness for a second. Emotionally, this sound here, it's got a it's got a strong, tough feel to it. Right? It's, it's projecting strength, weight, authority. This is a soft sound. This sound is now more about... The sound is more about the release of the drums, the tail end of the drums, than it is about the attack of the drums. It's a different vibe. It's still got a fat, chunky thing. But this, this draws my attention to the drummer hitting the drum. versus there just being drums in the mix. So again, what you do with this stuff is up to you. But it's just, it's interesting to, to know what's going on and how that translates emotionally. So this, this is softness. You don't have to dig in so hard with the compressor. But you can make a sound tougher smoother and softer with the attack. All right, so let's move on to the release. Release is fun. I mean, release is like, everybody talks about attack and threshold and ratios and stuff with compressors, but to, to me, release is really, mm, it's, it's hard to hear release, but let's, let's get you hearing it. Let's slow our attack back up and bring our back down. Okay, let's dig back in. And now I'm going to bury the sound again. Okay, so now what we're going to focus on is the movement of the high frequencies. And in this case, the high frequencies would be the ride cymbal, primarily. There's a little bit of tickety-tackety from the bongos in there, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Let's just focus on the ride symbol and the movement of it. So if we think of the level being here, and this is quieter, this is louder, what's happening to that ride symbol is that it's ducking very quickly in response to the kick and the snare being grabbed by the compressor. Now you can see this on the activity meter here, the gain reduction meter. This meter is just jamming in response to the kick and the snare, but it's getting back to zero pretty quickly. So the effect that that has on the high frequencies and on the movement of the ride symbol is kind of a flicker. All right. Listen to what happens when I slow this release way up. We've 
got this sort of seasick reverse swelling happening on the cymbals now. So why is this interesting or useful? Let's get into the blend knob. What happens when we take this groove here, this overcompressed seasick groove, and we blend it in parallel? sound kind of the same. There's a little compression on them, but by and large, it... But it's the movement of the high frequencies because we got a low parallel blend, about 30% of an overcompressed signal with a lot of swimmy bumpiness on it. It's a cool sound because it changes the groove. It's not really obvious compression, If we go back to 100% blend and go to our fast release flicker, speed up the attack a little bit. Now let's put our blend back at 30%. simple dance. It's, there's hi-hat chicken away under there too. But now the cymbals are just filling in the space between the kick and the snare without swelling back up. It's a great effect. Somewhere between that crazy slow pumping and this more flickering dancing thing. There's other forms of swing. You can really tune the way the cymbals are kind of doing this thing here. It just opens up a world of possibilities for you in terms of groove management. All right, so one more thing on release. I'd like to talk about release as a texture control. And specifically, I hear faster releases as brighter and more aggressive forms of distortion. So it's less about pumping and it's more about growl. And conversely, slowing the release up makes the sound literally a little darker and smoother and it makes the compression feel more relaxed. And so those are colors that I will use all the time, especially on drums and on vocals as well. Uh, let's get in here for that. So I'm going to turn things up now because we're focusing more on the back end of the sound rather than the front end. Okay, so what I hear now on the drums is I hear a bright ride cymbal and a growling kick. Like, boom, boom. And I hear a bright kind of splatting snare. Those three things will change with the release. Check this out. The kick drum now has lost a lot of that whoa sound and it just sounds more flappy. The snare sounds faster. It sounds tighter compared to here. Different envelope. And the ride symbol is it's less bright. It's 
it's also more diffuse and spread out. That ride cymbal here sounds more like a more individual hits on the ride. It's more of a smooth wash. So, ah, release. So near and dear to my heart. And that is how to hear compression on drums. You've got an attack control which gives you phenomenal control over the transient and therefore the toughness and the punch drawing your attention to the drummer hitting the drum versus the drum sounding out in the room, a hard and aggressive, punchy, thick sound versus a fast, soft, kind of smushy sound. Over on the release side, you've got a tremendous amount of control over the movement of the compression. If it's a fast, flickering, kind of crunchy, distorted sound, or if it's a slower, more mellow, kind of dancing, swimming sound, of all these possibilities and then when you start to blend them in parallel you get sort of a universe opens up to you in terms of the colors and the textures that compression offers so getting beyond just simple squashing a signal or holding a vocal in place or gluing things together you start to think of compression as texture and vibe and movement you get into compression more as an art form as a way to manage density and transient and movement that's when things really start to get fun with compressors but before you okay it's you guys's take on this hi kimberly hi gabriel hi sorry i'm late yeah no problem um so what's you guys's take on gregory scott's expression and definition and processing of uh, of compression. It makes more sense now. Go ahead, Kimberly. It makes more sense now, honestly. Can you elaborate a little more a little bit more? <laughs> uh like just the way he was able to describe each piece as they were brought in it helped because I was already a little bit confused on compression because I couldn't really hear it but as he brought in he has he brought it in little by little piece by piece and explained what we were trying to listen to it helped a lot right it it's it, it really does bring it really does bring a lot to the conversation when somebody could sit down and put everything in content in, in the context that you need it to be, right? Yeah. And and the main tool for me has always been in, in this class uh, has always been I, I need to make sure that you guys are um, are understanding critical listening through this whole process okay because if you guys aren't getting the whole critical listening uh, aspect of this then i'm just throwing numbers and everything at you guys and showing you presets and settings and if you do this the drums will sound amazing and what's the difference between that and any other YouTube video or presets that you get on plugins where you're just cycling through presets, not necessarily knowing is this correct or not, because you don't know how to listen for these features. Okay. So e even if this is the only thing that we, that you guys get out of this uh, class, it's, it's, it's the importance of how to do critical listening. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to chime in besides Kimberly? Yeah. Um, I will. To me, compression is like really a lot about shaping transients. And so I really like the way he described that. Because um, there's a lot of like listening in for the transients of the sound and how, uh, how they change with the front end and the tail end of the attack and release. Yes, and 
how does that how does his approach fit in with how you've thought of compression to this point it's pretty much right in line with it okay good good anybody else have want to chime in um yeah i mean he made it pretty clear what to listen for and i was able to hear the difference between what he was doing between the attack and release but i know what i'm listening for but i can't I guess still put into words what I was supposed to be listening for. I don't know if he set his own definition of attack and release or compression, but I was definitely following along with him when what he was saying, what to listen for, but I still probably couldn't explain it to someone. Which is fine. Yeah. <laughs> if again, if if the only thing you get out of this this series of compression compression lectures is your brain starts making sense of what you're hearing and you're able to hear those differences. So the next, when you start compressing your own mixing projects for this class or further on, at least it's processing and making sense. That's fine. Yeah. You only really need to uh, be able to explain to somebody else how to do something and how it works. If you're, if you're in my situation where you're teaching, right? Yeah. Um, but at least I'm glad that you it's it's working. So, um, with everything that with everything that I've done in my career, uh, I've tried to to define myself in one role or the other. Initially, I really wanted to be more on the side of the engineering uh, part, um, and and just kind of building on uh, on that. I, I wanted to initially find a role for myself within the studio, Fat Planet, and within the people I was working with. Um, I was working with a couple of producers and artists, and I, know, I knew what I could bring to the table is a really deep understanding of the engineering part of it, how everything works, and how to get the best sound out of the equipment and what equipment to use because I understood it, right? And and what I wanted to do as a goal is work with different producers so that all this equipment to him and to the artist that we're working with disappears. It just becomes transparent. An artist gets behind the microphone, starts singing, and it just sounds good. And the producer hears it and it says, that sounds great. Let's start recording and doesn't put any more thought into, into that process. It's him concentrating on, um, let's make some good music, get some great performance. And then when we're mixing and we're doing everything else, that was part of the process of making all this transparent. The producer wants something, he tells me what he wants, and I know enough of the equipment and I know enough of how the equipment works to dial up something to what he wants, okay? So in this class and this semester, I'm kind of going jumping back and forth on, here's some of the technical side of the equipment, so then you can, and, and how that technical, technical side applies to function, and then you can put those two things together and then have a more fundamental understanding, whether you guys are interested as much as I am in the whole gear, geeky, circuitry, stuff like that, like I am, or not, at least you have an introduction to it. And then if you want to do something else with it, great. But at least you have a fundamental understanding. So let's jump in to something else that's really critical, which is fundamentals of how a compression, a compressor works and explaining the circuitry that's in it. And I'm not going to play this whole video, but I want you guys to understand some of the signal flow here. And more importantly, understand the importance of sidechain. So let me ask you guys right now, um, what does a sidechain do in a compressor? Triggers the compressor to activate. triggers the compressor to activate yes can you expand on that a little bit 
Yeah. So like, uh, if you have, um, a bass and then you have like a kick, uh, it's really common to side chain the kick to the bass. So that way those transients where the kick and the bass are hitting together, the bass kind of ducks up like the beginning of that bass note kind of ducks out of the way for the kick and you hear them both. All right. So perfect. That, and, and the point you brought up is kind of what I want to, to jump into. There's a, there's a misconception of what a side chain is. Side chain has become this technical term of this trick that you do of s sending the kick into the side chain of a bass compressor or, or a bus compressor and have the whole mix pump to the kick. A side chain isn't a trick. A side chain is part of the circuitry of the compressor. And the only function of a side chain is not to be used as an external feed into the circuit. The side chain is the whole detection circuit. The attack release ratio all happen within the side chain circuit. Everybody understands it as external side chain and, and that's the trick that you do, but a compressor has a amplification circuit and a side chain circuit and the amplification circuit is triggered or told what to do by the side chain. So and another word of thinking a about what a compressor does, it's the equivalent of you putting your, your finger on a fader and raising and lowering the volume of a vocal and you're listening and you're reacting to that performance. That's all that a compressor does. But within that possibility it, it, of this raising and lowering of, of volumes, okay, there is there are envelopes that can be dialed in to do specific things, okay? And then compressors have been developed to be able to compress to a certain degree that really can be exaggerated, right? That you can completely bring up the noise floor of 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 um, of a recording, like a drums. If you have a live venue, uh, live tracking room, and suddenly the drums sound on the dry side, but when you put that mix bus compressor, now the drums sound like they're in the room because you're pulling in that verb, natural acoustics that's in the room. Okay, all those decisions fall within the side chain and they tell the amplification circuit what to do. Okay, so let's dive into this so you can kind of see what a side chain does. And this is a really interesting video. Um, this gentleman here owns a company. Um, it is DIY, D, DIY Recording Equipment. He has a great website. He makes some of these uh, 500 series units that I have here. And he developed the color palettes, which I mentioned before, are basically analog plugins that you put into this 500 series system that now you dial up something and now you have a, a, a simplified 1176 circuit, uh, a line driving circuit, an EQ circuit, um, all in the analog realm and you just dial things up and good to go. Um, so he's kind of going to give the breakdown of a compressor and then we'll kind of just take the conversation from there. Here we go. Hi everybody, I've got something very exciting on the bench for tearing down today. It's an 1176 compressor. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's the most famous compressor of all time. Uh, it's a FET compressor, uh, so we're going to get into what that means and what makes it so distinctive. But uh, first from the outside, we've got uh, input control, which is what the 1176 used instead of a threshold, was it has a fixed threshold. More on that later. Uh, and then you controlled how much gain was going into that threshold. An output control, which is our makeup pad or trim, uh, attack release, ratio, your meter, and then uh, meter in on and off. Uh, but let's get inside and see what's going on under the hood. Okay, let's see what we got going on here. So power comes in here, uh, AC from the wall, into this big power transformer here. 
then out to this board uh, for the power switch, and then over to the main board here. Uh, what else we got going on in the power section? Ooh, look at this guy. Okay, so this, you will not find this part in uh, in many modern designs. In fact, I don't even believe that they used this part after the Rev D of the 1176. Um, it is called a shunt diode? No, 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 a stud diode. Uh, it's basically a Zener diode that regulates the um, the voltage down to our 30 volts, which is our main power rail for everything in here. Um, and then we have another Zener here, a much smaller one, uh, and that just gives us our negative 10 DC, which is going to be our reference voltage for the gain reduction section. And then some big caps here um, for reservoir. Those provide current when, when the circuit needs it quickly. It also does filtering to filter out noise from the power supply. Um, so that's about it for the power supply. Now I'm going to scooch over to show you the audio section and a block diagram. First thing that the audio signal will see is the input attenuator. Um, this is the input knob. It's basically before anything else, uh, you can turn down or up the, uh, the input level before it goes to the balanced input, which is this transformer. This is a mu metal transformer. It would have been made by UTC back in the day. Uh, and it does a bit of a step down to get us to the gain control FET. So, not a whole lot of preamble before we get to the main event, which is this single transistor here, which is what does all of the gain control in the entire compressor. That's why it's called a FET compressor. We're going to go really deep on this in a moment, but for the moment we're going to move on to the signal preamp, which is this stage right here. It's class A, discrete, um, very critical to the sound of the unit because it's providing 26 dB of gain. Uh, so that's plenty of gain for those transistors to show their nonlinearities and, and uh, impart some color. And then we feed the output pot, which is this passive attenuator here. Oops, nope, this one. <laughs> and that's basically just our uh, make up gain, except it's actually just a passive pot before we go to the signal line amp, which is right here. Do you guys understand what a passive pot is? What he means by that? No, I don't. All right, so you can have an active circuit, which is basically an amplifier, like you see he's referring to at the gain compressor FET. There's amplification happening there. A passive pot is basically just a series of resistors. So then you're putting more or less resistance to the signal, so you're, you're lowering the volume. You're not raising the volume. You're not amplifying it. You're just putting resistance that will lower the signal as it goes through. Oh, okay. Okay? So basically, yeah. if you turn the output knob all the way to the max, there is no resistance. Signal is going straight through fed from the actual amplification circuit that's happening on the input. Got it? Cool. Moving on. Another discrete Class A stage. Both of these are very similar, uh, if not identical, to the 1108 uh, mic preamp from Yuri. And then the balanced output, which is this big transformer here would have been made by Reichenbach, which became Cinemag, who we all know and love. Um, but I, you know, if you go straight through here, you miss something very important, which is this little thing feeding back here. Uh, this is the side chain. This is what they call on the circuit board here, the gain reduction control amp. And this is where the uh, control voltage for the FET is created and manipulated. And so all the rest of the controls, attack, release, ratio, all that are contained within the side chain here. Um, and I want you to note something really interesting. The side chain gets tapped at the same point uh, as the output pot from the signal preamp. It's not before the FET, it's after the FET. So this is what's called a feedback style compressor, meaning the side chain actually 
at the same time is telling the FET what to do and also seeing what the FET does and then working that into what it tells the FET to do. Uh, it can kind of break your brain uh, if you're not used to thinking about feedback in electronic circuits, but it's a big part of the sound of the unit. Uh, feed forward and feedback compressors can sound very, very different. Um, so that is a basic... Uh, Another important note there I want to stop. The majority of the compressors that you know from like the analog stuff, 1176s, um, DBX 160s, SSLs, all these compressors that you normally see people using and then there's plug-in versions of these. And the majority of the plugins that you that you use unless it specifically says it are feedback circuits as opposed to a feed forward. A feedback, the signal goes through the amplification circuit. After it gets the amplification through the amplification circuit, it then gets fed back into the into the side chain and then the side chain tells the amplification circuit what to do. So so the compressor is reacting to the music instead of <clears throat> the compressor being anticipating what the music is going to do. And if you think about it, reacting to the music tends to be what we would do naturally. We are listening and controlling as we go. So part of this process was it sounds more musical to have a compressor work as a feedback. There's other advantages also uh, to it. It is easier to tailor, to tailor the function of a sidechain in a feedback circuit than it is to tailor the function of, of a sidechain in a feed forward. In a feed forward, the signal goes from the input straight to the amplification circuit, and a copy of that goes to the sidechain. But if you have the the signal from the from the input into the side chain, you're gonna make that side chain react quickly and drastically to what's happening. So then you have geniuses like Rupert Neve who manipulate the shape and the sound and the signal going into the side chain on his feed forward circuits. And, and turn it into something more musical that is so pleasant to hear, but it also opens up a whole other series of tones and palettes and shaping capability because of how he shapes that input signal going straight into the side chain. Okay? So again, let's, for now, this is a feedback circuit. Uh, kind of block diagram of the circuit, let's go deep now on the gain control FET. So the FET in the FET compressor just makes up one leg of a voltage divider. So let me explain first what a voltage divider is, and then we'll get to how the FET works in that context. So a voltage divider is just two resistors or two resistive elements uh, in such a configuration that they reduce the voltage at this node between them by a certain amount. So input here is one volt. Uh, let's say these are the same value. Your output here is gonna be half a volt. I'm not gonna get into the formula for it, um, but basically what you need to understand is that a voltage divider can divide the voltage. It can reduce the voltage. Um, and so we can do cool things with that, like volume controls, like uh, this second one down here, where R2, is a variable resistor. That's what this symbol means here. It's a rheostat or a variable resistor. And so if you vary R2, now you have a volume control. That's all that's happening in the FET compressor is the FET is replacing R2. And a FET is a transistor. It's an active device. 
And one of the cool ways you can use it is that you can use one of the pins to control the resistance between the other two. So the three pins of a FET are the gate, drain, and source. And the resistance between drain and source typically is very, very high. With, with no voltage here, it's, we can assume this is infinite. And in a voltage divider, if R2 is infinite, there's no voltage reduction. There's no gain reduction. But if you apply DC voltage to the gate, you can gradually lower this resistance, which will gradually lower the voltage here. Uh, so it's basically just like our volume knob here, but instead of having a knob, we have a DC control voltage. And where does that DC come from? Well, I gave it away, from sidechain. So basically the way this works is that the sidechain takes a peek at the audio somewhere here after the, uh, the preamp section, manipulates it a bit, uh, you know, sets the ratio, uh, converts it to DC, and then sets the um, attack and release, and then sends it back here as a control voltage for the FET, telling it basically, oh, okay, the voltage level, uh, sorry, the signal levels here, you need to be at this resistance. Oh, now it's down here. Okay, the resistance can go up for less gain reduction. And that's it. I mean, it's really, um, in principle, a very simple thing. Um, and you, you would think, you know, if, if all these components were ideal, extremely linear. Uh, but, of course, these, all these components are not ideal, thank God. All right, now let me skip forward a little bit so we can go into a little more of the intricacies of what make a 1176 special and probably something you never really knew about the function of 1176. Because it's, it's pretty wild. So let me give you a quick uh, orientation. This is all the audio circuitry input, output uh, that we've been through already. This is the power. And then all this is the sidechain. So you can see right away that the sidechain is a major part of the circuit. Um, the sidechain comes off of the audio here and comes back to the FET here. This is our gain control FET right there. Um, so the ratio on the 1176 is much more interesting and complex than I had originally thought. Um, those numbers on the front, 4, 8, 12, 20, they don't mean much. I hate to break it to you. They don't, they don't mean what you think they mean. Um, in fact, the ratio control, which is these switches here, aren't really a ratio control at all. Uh, it turns out you can't really control the ratio of uh, this kind of compression. Uh, you can only control the threshold. So another myth busted. Uh, not only does the 1176 have a threshold control, uh, we call it ratio. Uh, so let me just quickly go over how this works without getting, I'll try to stay out of the weeds. Um, basically, you can't send instructions in a logarithmic way to a FET, uh, at least with this technology here. And we hear things in a logarithmic way in terms of volume, meaning um, something that's two volts isn't twice as loud to our ears as one volt. It's 6 dB louder. Every time you double the air pressure or the voltage, it goes up 6 dB, which is not doubling in loudness to us. Um, so what implications does that have here? Well, let's imagine you're the FET and you know nothing about humans or the way that they hear audio and neither does anything else in the side chain. And you have a voltage coming in at uh, one volt. So we've got uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're in the verse. We're at one volt. Uh, it's a very steady thing. You know, let's say it's a, a super compressed bass. Um, and then let's say pretend for now our threshold is also one volt. So Here's our threshold, one volt. Our audio is also around there. So it's just kind of getting tickled by the compression here. Now the chorus hits and we're up to two volts. And so a certain amount of compression is happening here based on the, the ratio switch, which is really a threshold. Okay, and then we go up, well, let's say it's a big bridge. We go up 6 dB again. That actually goes up to four volts. So to what our ears was just 6 dB is now way over the threshold for the FET. And it just keeps getting worse and worse until, you know, when you get to 20 dB, 
that's actually a 100 times bigger voltage. And the poor little FET doesn't know that that's just 20 dB to our ears. It's getting 100 times more of the DC control voltage than it was uh, down here when it was 6 dB above. So the ratio is actually dependent on the input signal. And so you can't determine with these switches a single ratio. You, um, it's just not something you could do with this technology. And again, it's kind of like, thank God, because it sounds awesome. Um, and so what the ratio is really doing is this kind of delicate um, dance where it's adjusting the amount of DC bias sent. Uh, basically, it's controlling the AC threshold, which is the amount of signal going into the side chain, and also the DC threshold, which is kind of where these rectifier diodes will start sending DC to the transistor. But uh, yeah, so in brief, and this is really a theme with analog audio, especially older things, is it's like, it's, they, they knew what they wanted to do. They had a very limited set of tools. And so they did something that kind of worked like that. And they put it in studios and people were like, wow, this sounds awesome. Uh, is it really four to one? I don't care. <laughs> it makes the snare sound amazing. Uh, so that's, that's what's really going on with the ratio. Another kind of fun thing I just want to point out is if you're familiar with the all buttons in mode, that's where you push in all four of these ratio switches at the same time. I know this looks like eight switches here if you're following along closely, but they're actually just four double pole switches. So um, that's what this connector line here means. But so if you push all four in, you get a ton of compression. The meter goes crazy. It's a kind of signature trick of the 1176. Um, what I realized looking at the schematic is what happens when you're in all buttons in mode is that all these switches are bypassing these resistors here, basically. They're in by default, and then the each switch bypasses a different resistor. If you just put in the first switch and the fourth switch, you can bypass all those resistors. And same over here. You put in the first switch and the fourth switch. Um, so you don't actually need to uh, put all buttons in to get all buttons in mode. You can just put in the first and the fourth switch. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the ratio there. Okay. Did you guys get that? Yeah. Everybody familiar with the all buttons in function 1176? Yeah. All right. Is that a little bit crazy to think that I really never needed all buttons in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used that last week when I was trying to push all four buttons in, and every time you pop one, just a slightly different timing, the other three pop out. <laughs> yeah, it is It is definitely a skill set. It's, it's, it's a technique to learn how to push all four in at the same time. <laughs> uh, and yeah. I've, I've definitely had to work on it. We have two 1176s in the A room, and um, one of them is always set on all buttons in and that's normally where I, I run my vocals in parallel through and the other one will be varying depending who's using it or whatever the function is where they're whether it's like a four to one because I'm just putting it on the base uh, or I've the 1176 has so much color to it I I can put it in bypass mode not not in like the hit an actual hard bypass but you can actually hit the, the relay switches, the ratio switches, so no compression ratio is engaged. And now you just have an amplifier, right? And then and now I adjust the input and the output so that the signal going in and going out is the same. And now I'm adding color, the FET tonality into it, and I can drive the input and lower the output to saturate a kick drum and get some really interesting attitude out of the kick drum with without even compressing it's just a, a different way of tone shaping okay all right now that we have these two videos out of the way let's jump on something else here so what 
what are you guys getting out of this second video on how does a compressor work and how does a side chain work? Anyone, anybody want to summarize what they got out of it? Is how a side chain works? Is this is this what you expected at least? Not really, I guess, because um, the way that it like kind of goes through the circuit a little bit and then goes back through the circuit, that was kind of weird. Right, and then. Uh, I understand the side chain feedback process, but I am still kind of confused on when and why I would use it in compression. That's that's the next part uh, of this lecture. Okay, so I wanted to go through all this process first. So one, you know how to listen, what to listen for. Two, you understand the function, the me mechanics behind a compressor. So then now when we get to the next part of this lecture, you understand why I'm doing these decisions and how I'm making these decisions. And that's basically going to answer Gabriel's question on when and why. Okay. So because, uh, and just to finalize this, now you, do you guys understand also why I'm making that, um, that comparison of a fader which a fader is basically a resistor value that you're changing up and down as you're moving it, right? And and that analogy to the, the side chain circuitry that's being fed into the FET. The FET is just basically changing the resistance value, and that's what creates the compression, right? So that that's that's where that analogy comes from. You are just doing volume control. There's a lot more things that are happening in the compressor than would happen in the fader because there's actual tonal change that that is being uh, that is caused by the circuit right but it is still basically just you writing the volume now let's let's flip this around let me make this go away And let me bring this up. And we're back to the song that I've been using for uh, with you guys. Uh, I started using with you guys in the um, in the EQ lecture. And then now I've added compression to all, basically all the channels. And we're going to start the lecture with just uh, uh, doing compression on kick and bass. We probably only have enough time to just deal with comp the compression on the kick, but then we'll next class we'll jump on bass and then we'll go down the line. But I want to really concentrate on you guys understanding the why and the how on compression. So l let me give you my two cents on how I visualize and how I process compression and how I do that is getting is approaching it from a different technical point of view from a different me being geeky nerdy about frequencies and sound frequencies are what they're a form of speed right you have a distance and you have a time frequency is per second that's a static distance a, a static time but the distance varies and what does distance mean in frequencies? If you have a 1K tone, that means that in one second, you have 1,000 waves being produced. But a wave has a wave length. And let's just throw numbers here. I'm not saying that this is the accurate, this is exactly what it is. But a 10,000 hertz wave has a wavelength of let's say one inch a a 1k tone has a wavelength of 10 inches one cycle moves uh, takes a, a moves a, a distance of 10 inches in one second and 100 Hertz uh, moves uh, 100 inches just to keep the math simple and in reality 100 Hertz 
going to be big away from that. But now let's go into attack. So if I set the attack to one millisecond, a one inch wavelength will probably not get through in time in a one millisecond attack. So you put in a compressor to react at one at one millisecond, that, a, that attack is gonna see that 10K wave and alter it, compress it, process it. That also means every other wavelength longer than that one inch 10K wavelength is going to also be processed. That makes sense? Follows? Yeah. Now, if we change that millisecond to 10 milliseconds, now probably multiple wavelengths of 10K can now pass before the attack is triggered and, and then start affecting and processing that 10K signal. That means that the signal processed at 10 milliseconds should sound brighter because 10K is passing uncompressed. No gain reduction is happening. More 10K is passing through the compressor than it was at one millisecond. Does that make everybody following now? So what happens at the 1K? Well, at 1K, definitely a one millisecond is getting compressed. But at 10 milliseconds, maybe one cycle is getting through. Okay, bye Kimberly. I'm recording this lecture, so I'll, I'll try to post it for you guys and put it on, on, on Canvas, okay? Thank you. You're welcome, bye. Okay, so now at 10 milliseconds, that one kilohertz waveform is getting processed, but maybe just one wavelength is getting through and then the compressor's clamping on. That means that from 10K all the way to 1K, all those frequencies are, are, are passing through unscathed, multiple wavelengths. Now, let's move the attack to 100 milliseconds. At 100 milliseconds, one, you have maybe one or two wavelengths of 100 hertz are getting through. And then the compressor's clamping onto it. So the shape of 100 hertz is getting altered by, at 100 milliseconds. But that means that everything from 10,000 to 1,000 to 100 to, you know, let's say 110 hertz is not getting processed with the same intensity as, as 100 hertz is at 100 milliseconds. And how frequencies function, if you're talking about a kick drum, the high frequencies that get reproduced at, at a kick drum, which is a transient percussive instrument, those 10K frequencies probably reach a peak and die out before the 100 milliseconds happens in the attack. So all 10K frequencies go unscathed. Maybe half of the lifespan of 1K go get through the attack circuit uh, detection before they start getting altered. So at 100 milliseconds, what I'm trying to explain is the kick is going to sound brighter because high frequencies are passing through. And the slower I put the attack, the more you're hearing mid-range to mid-low range to bass frequencies getting altered by that compression. Everybody following me till now? 
Yeah. Okay. You adjust the attack, and depending on the length of the attack, and depending on the transient value of that instrument, you're affecting more or less high frequencies on it. Okay, Gabriel, so the higher you place the attack, faster you mean? Or by higher, do you mean faster or do you mean slower? The more the wave frequencies you allow through. No. So the faster you set the attack, more high frequencies get processed. The slower you set the attack, the less high frequencies get processed. Because the, the, the higher frequencies have a shorter wavelength. And since it's shorter, less time passes for that wavelength to get through, uh, to, to uh, process through air. Shorter wavelengths means shorter time for those wavelengths to be reproduced. So a longer attack time processes less high frequencies. A shorter attack time can see, capture in time, high frequencies. Is that better, Gabriel? Okay, good. Let's go to the release. And let's stick with this analogy with waveforms. If you have a quick attack, let's say our attack is one milliseconds. So it's altering everything from 10K down to 100 Hertz, to keep it within the same example. If we now do a release of 10 milliseconds, the wavelength of 10K can probably fit a couple of times within that 10 millisecond release time. So you're, it's quick enough to grab the 10K and long enough to alter several wavelengths of 10K. So those settings are altering a lot of 10K, which if we go to analogies of, of Gregory Scott, if, you're, if the compressor is altering the high frequencies, it can make it, it could be part of the reason why a compressor can make things dark. If you're, if you're just altering the high frequencies, you're, you're basically lowering the high frequencies and, and making it, quote unquote, darker. But at 10 milliseconds, 1K wavelength can possibly pass one cycle and only one cycle gets altered. The rest of the cycles of 1K on this kick drum, to, to continue with that example also, aren't getting processed. So that mid-range tone isn't really getting altered, just very slightly. Very unperceivable if it's just one uh, wavelength, right? And that also means that 100 hertz, you probably have maybe a quarter of the wavelength, of one wavelength, being shifted. So that becomes more of an unperceivable difference at 100 hertz. If we shift that release to, let's say, 100 milliseconds, now 10K is being continuously compressed, probably for its entire lifespan on this kick hit. Then 1K tone, maybe half of its light span is being compressed. So now you're altering all of the high frequencies from 10K to 1K, and, and a, a lot of the mid-range that 1K to 2K is happening, and probably eight, 900 to 800 is also being compressed a, a decent amount. So now the mid-range is being pushed in and shaped in. Give me one quick second. Let me close the door to avoid that noise.
Professor, your mic is muted. Sorry. I, I, for some reason, I muted it in, in Zoom and I muted my mic here. Um, okay. Thank you for that. Okay, so when we have a, a release of 100 milliseconds, we are now altering, compressing everything from 10K to 1K, maybe a little below 1K also in a significant way. We're basically obliterating uh, the high frequencies, depending on the ratio, right? And are altering severely the mid-range and allowing maybe one wavelength of 100 hertz to get through altered, but the rest of the lifespan of that 100 hertz isn't being altered. So now we're decreasing the volume of the high frequencies and getting more low frequencies to get through. So this is a way for you to kind of tilt the tonality of a kick by reducing high frequencies and allowing the low frequencies to, to be unaltered. This is a way for you to take a kick, especially uh, if an uh, inside kick that you're focusing it on the beater and you're hearing a lot of the slap, you can tame the slap sound and, and then let the low end be unaltered. But on a kick, you kind of want to alter the low end a little bit, right? You kind of want to bring up the low end. So you use makeup gain to now decrease the top end, push the makeup gain up. So now that you've kind of flattened down the response of the high and the mid frequencies, the makeup gain brings the overall level up. That's the part of the design of a compressor, going back to the definition of you taking high levels down and low levels up by the makeup gain, we're bringing that low level of the bass uh, on the kick up to a more perceivable level. Everybody still following me with this example? Thumbs up on your screens. Yes, okay, good. Uh, Jackson, you following till now also? All right, so let's now dial up. Uh, is the makeup gain coming from the output node on the compressor? Yes. Depending on the compressor, like the 1176, the output knob is considered part of the makeup gain. Uh, there are compressors, especially in the plug-in world, that have a makeup gain knob, but you still also have an actual physical output like if you have a, an output fader to just control the overall level without affecting the makeup gain, which could be part of the compression circuit. Okay? But yes, output normally is regarded as your makeup gain. Now, let's, let's roll that milliseconds to 500 milliseconds. At 500 milliseconds, you are definitely compressing several wavelengths of 100 hertz. So now everything from 10K to 100 hertz is being altered severely. The entire lifespan of 10K is being compressed, probably the entire lifespan of 1K all the way down to close to 100 hertz is being compressed. So now you're basically just lowering the volume of the kick. Going back to Gregory Scott's example, when he's setting the attack really quick, you just hear everything go down in volume on that drum set. This is, this is where we're at in this explanation. Quick attack, long release, you're just bringing everything down. Now, let's keep the release at 500 milliseconds and let's start rolling back the attack. If we go to, uh, to sorry, uh, let's leave the release at 500 milliseconds. If we now roll back the attack from one millisecond to 10 milliseconds, now we're allowing 10K to get through. So now the kick is gonna start sounding brighter because the wavelengths of 10K are so short that they're, they're passing through that 100 millisecond. 
but we're still hearing 1K being altered all the way to 100, to 100 hertz being altered because the release is so long. Now we roll back the, the attack to 100 milliseconds and a lot of 1K is getting through. Maybe some 1K wavelengths are getting through and being altered, but we're now allowing the entire lifespan of 10K to get through unaltered because the attack is so slow. Very, very slight mid-range is getting grabbed by that 100 millisecond attack and being lengthened by the 100 millisecond release. But we know that a good chunk of 100 hertz is being grabbed by that 100 millisecond attack and, and kept there in compression for a lengthy time with a 500 millisecond release. So now when we dial up the makeup gain, what is happening? Again, we are bringing up the low end, but we're having high frequency transients conserved and bringing up the makeup gain takes the, the, the wavelength that, that the lifespan of 100 hertz and these big waveforms that take a long time to, to develop, those long wavelengths are being compressed when you normally see those wavelengths, they, they, they kind of fade out. The compressor is holding them for 500 milliseconds. So they now take a much longer time to fade out. And then when we bring up the makeup gain, you're hearing more of the sub energy being brought up. If you have a really high ratio, it could alter the shape of that low end in a way that you might not want. But if you have a low ratio, like a 1.5 to 1 or a 2 to 1, that low end is just gently squeezed and lengthened. But we're preserving the high frequency transient. That snap is not altered, but we're not lengthening it either. We're only lengthening the energy of the low frequencies, making that kick sound heavier because there's more low end life to the kick. On the flip side, when we when we were in the other example, where we were altering the high frequencies, we're diminishing the transient response of the kick, and allowing the transient response of the low end to per, to remain. So the kick sounds punchy, snappy in the low end, but less bright, snappy, more low-end punchy. But we're not lengthening the low-end, so the low-end doesn't sound thicker, longer. It just sounds, we could say, tighter in a sense, cuts through the woofer, you know, pushes that woofer in and out, but it's not necessarily lengthening, so it doesn't fight the, kit, the, the, bass, uh, the bass guitar for time and attention. Are you guys still following this? To a certain degree, at least. Yeah, to a certain, to a certain yeah, I feel like I am. Okay. Let me give you a little psychoacoustics and then we'll, we'll fall, we'll jump into the examples here. Um, when you're dealing with transient percussive instruments, drums, congas, cowbells, tambourines, short transient response. Um, they are at a disadvantage because you're, you're perceived, for you to perceive, um, for you to perceive importance in those instruments, those instruments need to be louder than everything else that has a longer decay. Anything that is shorter than about two to 300 milliseconds in its response, so kicks, 
tambourines, if you look at the waveform, it's a quick spike and down. It looks like a triangle wave, right? That decay is so short that falls under that 200 to 300 millisecond uh, re response. So your brain is going to say, well, it's not as important because it's just a little flicker. It's going to hone in on on a guitar part, on a bass part, on a vocal part that has more, uh, has a longer decay time. And if you want the drums or that tambourine to surpass its priority to your listening capability, you need, you need to make it significantly louder than the vocal, than the guitar, than the bass. That's why drums tend to be mixed up in the mix in a song. Or you alter the decay of that drum set by adding reverb. You can put you can record the drums with room mics and compress those and compress those room mics, and then now you're bringing up the decay. You can add an actual reverb plugin to the drums, and you lengthen out. That's also why gated reverb was was created for drums because you can control the length of the snare and the toms and you're you now you can mix the drums lower but it having a longer decay keeps it in the attention span of your brain okay the other way to to increase the decay of the drums is by compression you can use the envelope shaping tools, your attack, your ratio, and your release, to then alter the release, the decay time of the drums. You can allow the transients to get through so that snappiness uh, pulls your attention to it, and you can and expand the decay of those drums to get it past that 200 to 300 millisecond timing and, and create some importance onto those drums and anything else that's happening in that range. Still following me? Okay. Jumping onto the song. Let me mute the compression on the kick and bass, and let's listen to what we have. This is a pretty well tracked kick drum and a good sounding bass. I have kept the EQs I already showed you in the last EQ class. So I've already pre-shaped the kick to get what I want out of these mics. It's more, like I mentioned, a little more on the correction and subtraction EQing to just get out all the unnecessary frequencies with some tonal shifting to just kind of get it in get it in the direction that I need it to get. And now what I want to figure out is how do I want the kick and the bass to fit with each other? Just by listening to the kick and the bass in isolation and solo, I can hear both of them clearly. The bass currently has the low end. And the kick has some snap and some low end, but this bass has a good amount of top end. It's not a bright uh, pick played bass. It's finger played, so it has a nice warm round tonality to it, but there's enough brightness to it. And that bass has enough fre full frequency range that that top end is frequency masking the kick, the kick snappiness but also frequency masking the energy, uh, the dynamic energy of the low end of the kick. So the kick is clear, but it is sitting behind the bass. Okay, listen to it again. I have the volume set, so, 
So it's not necessarily a lack of volume. It's just them sitting in this place where they're, they're to a certain degree equal, but, but the bass still dominates your, your perceived hearing. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to go through different settings and then change that perception. Now let's get into what to listen for. As I explained in the EQ lecture, I can use EQ to alter the height of the instrument within the mix. I adjusted the EQ so I can make one instrument sound above other instruments by altering the high frequency and using some subtractive EQing to pull some frequencies out of that instrument so it doesn't fight instruments that are lower with it and now creates a separation of height whether I'm bringing it up from middle or below middle depending if it's a bass or a vocal or a string part. So I'm gonna play with this on the kick. I'm gonna try initially to this is a rock song I think I want the the kick to sit above the bass making it sound brighter, snappier, and letting the bass almost be pushed down and let the bass be prioritized as the low end of the song. Let's go over the distressor, which is what I'm going to be using. I already have five presets done for, uh, for this lecture. The distressor is a great compressor. It's a very much a a a one size fits all type of compressor, super flexible, and it is a standard in a lot of studios because of the flexibility. Um, just like the 1176, the the distressor doesn't have a threshold knob. You affect it has a fixed threshold, and you affect the amount of signal going into the threshold by giving it more or less input. And then you have an output at the end to compensate. And then you have an attack and a release. And the output becomes basically your makeup gain. Then you have compression ratios from one to one, meaning no compression is happening, but you are hearing what the kick would be sounding through the analog circuitry. So if you want to use the distressor as a tone shape it is something to just give it some color you can do one to one you can go two to one all the way to nuke it which nuke it basically is like a brick wall limiter you're just destroying something uh, it is just fun to just try out you then have the detector this is how you alter the side chain and remember how how the side chain this is a feed uh, back system. You know how the sidechain goes post the gain structure and gets looped into the sidechain. The signal goes post gain structure into the sidechain. Well, the external sidechain, what it does is it, it has a relay that will bypass the signal instead of going from post uh, amplification circuit into the sidechain, it looks for it somewhere else. In this case, what it's doing is it's not looking for external side chain. It's just altering the, the signal before it, it feeds the side chain. So the high pass is basically adding a filter on the low end. So before the signal gets into the side chain, it's filtering out the low end. So the side chain never hears that low end existed on this kick and it's only concentrating on everything above. In this case, the distressor, I believe, the high pass is at 80 hertz. This here is a mid-contour boost. It's creating a peak in the mid-range to make the sidechain more sensitive, make it overreact to that mid-range. And then the, the link is a way to make the, 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 the side chain from one compressor work with another compressor if you're in stereo. In this case it's mono, so it doesn't matter. Then the audio is actually altering audio where you're hearing 
you're filtering out the low end uh, of the kick and you hear it, or you're out, out, um, adding second to, and third order harmonics. So the distressor, the attack and release go from zero to 10. Zero is, is the fastest on both. 10 is the slowest on both attack and release. So if we look at this compressor, and let me mute the bass, we have a medium slow release. It's about 7.5 uh, uh, on the, sorry, on the, on the attack. It's a medium slow attack. The release is 5.5, 5.7. Let's call that a medium release. Now let's hear what happens. I'm going to play it and I'm going to bypass it to keep an eye on what I'm doing. And then I'm going to stop and then add the bass. And then you hear what's happening in relationship to the bass when I add or, or, or remove the compression. Here we go. How much of you heard a difference? It sounded more like focus to me. It's a good word. A little bit punchier. Okay. Like pointier though, especially in like the top end, like a little bit clickier. Good. That's correct. Does everybody else concur, or is everybody else like ah, I'm not quite sure what I heard? Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what what I heard, what the difference was. All right. Part of that is with each setting, I have maintained my gain structure. Getting back yeah. to, you know, I started with this conversation at the beginning of the semester. Yeah. Here's where it gets very critical. If you don't compensate for the gain reduction co correctly, then your perception of the compression is going to be incorrect. So no, you're going to notice that as I'm changing all these settings, the volume of the kick isn't changing because I don't want my procession to be altered by something being higher and lower in volume than what it should be. I yeah. only want to hear how the envelope of the compressor is altering the tonality of the kick, not fooling myself into thinking, oh, it sounds better or sounds worse because the volume has gone up or down. Yeah. So some of these things are going to be hard for you to hear and perceive when they're by themselves. But like Gregory Scott's example, he always had the roads there as a, as a control. Your controls of the road and then your compression on the drums is your actual test. So you can see what is happening in it. Okay. So let's add in the, the bass. Now, Another important thing for you to understand on how to do critical listening. It helps sometimes to not concentrate on the instrument that you're trying to compress. Let me repeat that. When you're listening now, don't pay attention to the kick, even though we're compressing the kick. Pay attention to the bass, the tonality of the bass, and where that bass is sitting in relationship depth-wise to the kick. When we started by itself, the kick and the bass were pretty much equal in intensity, but because the bass had longer decay, it overshadowed the kick in its priority to your hearing. Now let's listen to what happens with the kick. I'm going to start without the compression.
Hey, what are you guys hearing now? Is that a little easier for you to hear the difference, Damien? Uh, a little bit, a little easier. I I hear a difference, but I can't tell what it is. I think it's like, give me a second to like recollect. Sure. How about you, Jackson? Got something to add? Gabriel? Okay, good. Jackson. To me, it sounded like the, uh, the bass was kind of like floppy, I guess, and loose. Um, in a way that he's kind of like, he's kind of like just sitting a little bit in front of the kick. Um, I mean, you could st you could still hear the kick, but it sounded like it was just kind of like loose and then just a little bit in front. And then when you put the compression on, it felt like it was just a little bit behind, but there's a small difference. Right. And then, and then now that you're hearing the kick with the bass, does it confirm your, what your analysis of the kick by itself? Does it sound brighter and snappier with the compression as, as in relationship to the bass? Yeah, I think so. All right. I'm going to play it one more time and then ignore the bit, the bottom end of the bass. Just pay attention to the bright metallic tone of the bass, that nasally brought to it. And then listen to that part of the bass and listen to how the top end of the kick swings forward and backwards as I change the, the on and on, on and off the compression and, and how that relationship of the top end between both instruments get altered. Again, just the top end of the bass. That is that helping you guys to kind of fine tune what I'm listening for? Yeah. Go Do it one more time. Sure. Actually, let's move on to the next example and then just kind of keep these things in mind. Uh, Jackson says the kick seems tighter than at uh, that time and less airy on the release and sound. Or are you hearing it? It there is there is a tightening happening. Um, with it and and that tightening is is a a defined top end and that defined top end is kind of pulling some of that snappiness uh to it and that less air could be it's probably a good definition to it also i'm i'm, I'm allowing that air band to get through and i'm making the compressor grab onto that high mid-range to low mid range, I'm not touching the low end. I'm not touching the air band 10k above. I'm just trying to tighten that range where I want it to compete with the bass. I want the kick to be elevated up, so I'm concentrating on that mid range and make it be more competitive against the bass there, forcing the low end of the bass to be now the predominant dynamic push and then letting and pushing the snappiness of the kick forward and holding it in your face in front of the dynamic range of the bass top end. So this is a little on the lighter side of like a little more transparent, but this is what I mean by tone shaping with a compressor. When you use, Jackson, when you use these plugins, are you placing the compressor before or after you apply subharmonic? Uh, subharmonic, if I use it, would be at the very end. I try to get 
I, I can do a lot to the low end with just a compressor. I normally don't need to add a subharmonic uh, to, a, to a kick unless it didn't re get recorded correctly and I'm having to alter drastically the sound of what's there and that becomes a production problem. Uh, or if I'm looking for specific effects, I'll throw in a, 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 sub, a subharmonic. Uh, I might use a little more subharmonic if I'm doing a hip hop mix uh, than on a rock mix, but that doesn't mean I don't use subharmonics on rock mix mixes either. Okay. Um, okay. Good. Glad I answered that question ahead. Okay. Let's jump to um, setting two. Pay attention to the screen and tell me what settings are changing from preset one to preset two on the kick. Somebody chime in. Setting one, setting two. What changed? It looks like a, pretty much everything changed except the detector. Um, so I didn't really have time to track all of it, but so, I know that the input got louder uh, and the attack got slower. Um, and looks like the release got maybe quicker. Yes, yeah, yes. quicker. So the attack goes from 7.5 to 10, much slower. That's as slow as it gets pretty much. The release goes from a medium release, about 5.5, to 0.5. It's almost as quick as you can make it. And then, of course, since I have made the attack much slower, that means that less signal is, it, more signal is getting through the compression detection circuit before it gets altered. I now have to bring up the input so I can get more compression more signal into into it for it to be detected how I want it to be detected. So based on the theory that I've postulated for you guys, what is the expected result? If I have a slower attack and a really quick release, tonally, what should happen, especially compared to what we had before? What's going to happen to the top end? You're going to get a little less top end, I think. Less top end what? Compression? Yeah, processing. Yes. Are you going to process more top end or process less top end with a slower attack? Less top end. Um, less top end. Yeah. Less top end processing. Good. Uh, and what's going to happen to the low end? The low end should get processed to some degree, right? Because yeah. the low end frequencies are wider, longer, so they get processed. But what's going to happen to that low end that's getting processed if the release is 0. 0.5? It's going to concentrate on the low end, but it's not going to process it for a very long time, is it? So it's this should sound maybe brighter than the first setting because more top end is coming out and 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 going on Jackson's po uh, point of view maybe airier because I'm allowing more mid-range to go through so you're hearing less of shaping in that high to mid-range but I am I am altering more of the mid low to low but I'm not extending the decay of the low end very much I might just be bringing it up a bit to alter the low end and maybe concentrate on that low mid range and still allowing 50 Hertz let's say the very bottom the sub range 60 to 40 Hertz on the kick to be unaltered because the release is so short that that sub range is so such a big wavelength is not being altered so I'm 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 steering the 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 focus to that mid low to top range of the bass. Let's call it 
100 to 80 hertz without getting into the sub range. Everybody agree with it, with that? Yeah. Let's hear it. Kick by itself. that sound like you guys expected it it sounded like when it's when it's bypass the kick like the low end of the kick is very kind of like big room like kind of like how greg gregory scott said like it was roaring almost and then when it when it's not bypass when the compressor is working it just sounded <clears throat> tighter like just not not so big and almost muddy in a way not so room it's, filling it's not enhancing the low end at all it's almost, yeah exactly it's almost like i've 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 filtered out the sub range uh jackson says yes i know i'm probably not describing the right way but i hear i hear there was an impression good you hear the difference so i have now made the compressor almost act like a a low cut filter so I'm, I'm even, I'm pushing this kick e even more away from the low end. So it'll interact very differently with the bow, with the bass now. Right? So let's add the bass and, and, and kind of continuing on Jackson's point of airier, it doesn't sound airier, but if you notice, I am compressing this kick way more. It was one to two dBs of gain reduction. Now it's four to five dB of gain reduction. So the fact that I'm compressing it a lot more is altering that top end. Normally, the more gain reduction, the less open it sounds. It's forcing more of this mid-range and low mid-range forward. So let's hear this uh, against the bass. What are you guys hearing? Is that what you expected? It sounds like kind of hearing like the kind of sounds like a fat, like little block of sound. Um, Good description. Yeah, like I, 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 it's not very good, but I don't know how else to describe it. Like that's how I'm hearing it. It's like if I was to look at the waveform of it, I feel like it'd be more square looking than a triangle, in a way. Um, and it, it, it kind of is cool the way it's interacting with the bass because you kind of hear like this fat kick, um, and then like the top end and harmonics of the bass over top of that. But not fat so. in in low end deep 808 fat right right not fat in that sense but fat as in just like a thick yes, front yes. transient yeah right and and when the kick hits you it definitely overpowers dynamically the bass like you you ignore the bass completely every time the kick hits and then the the bass is definitely sitting behind the kick now right but even though it's a fat block vertically horizontally is it's not super long so you can still hear the harmonics of the bass and everything over top of that so it's like yeah you get you don't hear the bass for a second but it's just like a little second right. so you can still hear it connecting and hitting those notes in time with the kick right 
So here, and now that you bring that up, this is a way for you to mess with the dynamics of a kick and force it to be forward without necessarily needing side chain compressing to the base. I know that's a standard and everybody says you have to do it. You don't have to do it. If you understand how to alter the shapes of your kick, you can place it wherever you want it in relationship to the base. Does that mean I don't side chain the base to the kick? I always do. But how much I use it, when I use it, now becomes a, a choice of, of production and arrangement, not as a necessity to make the kick sound in front of the bass. Okay? This type of kick sound, I would tend to use more on a rock tune, especially in a fast punk tune, where that kick needs it's you know you have 150 180 200 bpm punk songs that the kick just needs to snap you need to hear it it needs to hit you in the face but if you put too much low end to it it gets heavy and muddy and you lose the definition from one kick to the other you just want it to sound a little maybe on the low five in that sense because it's more of a knock instead of a oomph to it and that's just really going to give you that dominant kick sound and then let the body and, and the wall of sound come from the low end of the guitars and the bass. Is that making sense? Um, this is also a way for you to say if you, you can apply these type of settings to something else in the percussion realm. You can have two kicks if you're doing hip-hop or, or EDM stuff and have one kick compressed this way and another com kick compressed some of the other ways I'm going to show you that enhances the low end and you can expand the height of both kicks, especially if they're two alternating kick samples that counterpoint each other. You can give it height and prioritize ton tonally what they're doing within that mix. Okay, setting three. What's changing between setting two and setting three, two, three, two, three. Uh, higher output and a uh, slower release. There's not really much, there's a small change to the input and the attack. So very much a longer release like the release is going from 0.5 yeah. to 7 that's huge based on this what do you guys expect will happen I I want to say we'll get more low end that's I second that that sounds about right based on my theory right yeah uh, Jackson, uh, when you use the compressor to sidechain, are you engaging that on the compressor itself? Do you have the, do you have to place the same compressor on the bass and engage the sidechain there as well? Not sure I'm following that. If you're talking about sidechain compressing on the bass guitar, what I do, I normally have a compressor on the bass and I'm making that compressor uh, the side chain of that compressor, look at the bass, do whatever tonal shaping I want to the bass, do whatever else I'm, I'm going to do to that bass, if it's EQing or whatever other processing, and then at the very end of the bass, I'll put a second compressor, and that has the kick as, a, as feeding into the side chain, and I'm externally side chaining that bass compression and making it react lightly to what I need it to be. Hope that answers your question. Let's get down to listening to the kick by itself and then uh, going to the bass. And again, the theory that Damien and Gabriel then supports is more low end. Let's hear what that sounds like.
notice that now we're going back into that lighter gain reduction, right? What did you guys hear, and is that what you expected? Not really what I was expecting, but I don't really know what I was expecting either. So Fair. Um, there's that. But anyways, um, as far as just like what I was hearing is it sounded like airy, but not like 10K airy. It was like sounded like kind of like woofy, like resonant. Like I felt like I was hearing the resonant head. That's that's very good observation. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with that. And what happened to the low end? Was it more low end? I it could just be the room I'm in, um, but I didn't really hear too much of a low end enhancement. Really, what I heard is like I heard somewhat of a low end enhancement, but it was just coming from like hearing the resonance and the woofiness. It didn't really come from like a thicker, bigger low end frequencies. At least that's how I perceived it. Damien, do you concur? <laughs> No, yeah, kind of the same. Like I didn't, it didn't feel like there was more low end. It didn't feel like uh, there was more sub or like rumble or anything. But it did kind of feel like it was the kick itself was just punching through more. Like I could kind of hear like the the transient of the kick a little cleaner. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So then this kind of goes back to my first setting where it's a little more on the transparent side. You know, it's doing something, but it's not that obvious until we yeah. add the base critical listening here again the purpose of this setting is the opposite of my first setting my first setting was to take the kick and raise the height and and focus the compressor in altering the top end of the kick so the dynamic range of the top end of the kick is a little more in your face and dominates the the base, forcing it to sit above the base. Then I'm like, you know what? I, I took that to a further extreme on setting two, and I really made that mid-range to high mid-range to low to maybe low mid-range really forward. And I'm like, I this is a little too punk rock. This is a little more indie rock. Maybe the bass, since it's so melodic, should sit above the kick. Let it be a dominant, more mid-high frequency thing moving along with the other instruments and let the kick be a low-end support. So now instead of raising the height of the kick, I'm going to lower the height of the kick. I'm not going to emphasize the air. I'm going to take that low mid range and make that dynamically push forward so when we're listening to it now listen to the low end of the kick of the bass not the kick listen to where the bass low end is sitting in relationship to the kick with and without compression here we go You guys hearing that? It's almost like if the bass now sounds thinner. Like the bass, now you're mainly perceiving that upper end growl to the bass, but not really perceiving the fullness of the bass. Do you guys concur? Yeah. <laughs> Is that a good description? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good description. Um, it just sits like it just sits lower in my ear. I don't feel like I lose too much of that fullness on the bass. But I feel on like I, 
yeah, but I feel like I definitely hear the kick lower. Um, again, that could be my room, though. Um, no, no, you're, I feel like, you're, I feel you're like correct till now. I, yeah, I feel like uh, there's some like low mid. Maybe it's a high mid, but there's some like mid range frequency in the bass that I feel like gets exaggerated when the compressor's on, and I feel like that helps fill out its fullness a little. Right. Even though I'm not touching the bass you're hearing almost more change happening to the bass than you hear, than you notice it as much on the kick. Do you agree? Totally, yes. Yeah, totally. So then, as far as in the mixing field, all that I hear is the kick drum being lower than the bass. Right, so then this is this is the fun part of, of psychoacoustics and, and compression. Everybody's like, compress the kick, compress it in solo to get this but you're completely missing the point. It's how you shape the kick in relationship to the other instruments that are supposed to interact with the kick, and that's how you make the proper decisions, which is exactly Gregory Scott's point that he's trying to do, where you listen to the flow, you listen to the interaction, to the tone, that dynamic push and pull, and you can do so much to completely change the perspective on not just the kick but everything around the kick will change based on what how you compress the kick so i decided to push that even more on setting four let's concentrate more on the low end so now i decided you know what i'm tired of doing a, a two to one what happens if I do the four to one? Let's get aggressive here. One, one kind of rule, I don't want to say a rule is no thing necessarily fixed, but one of the big observations that I've done with, with compression is the higher the ratio, the more it affects the low end. It can alter so much the shape of the low end that if you want, if you if you go to higher ratios, it's almost like if you lose low end punch and definition, it 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 it's almost like adding a filter to it again, and then it's not quite what it is, and then and, and and that pertains more to like the sub frequencies. So if you're wanting to enhance the sub frequencies, you go to a higher ratio. You, that's not quite gonna be what you want to do. And that applies to bass, to synths, to to kicks also. Okay, so always room for you to play around with it, but just as, as you're trying to alter things, kind of keep that in mind. So here it's four to one. I now have a mid attack, a uh, mid fast release, pretty fast is almost three. But notice that I removed the high pass filter on the side chain. So now the kick is the compressor is hearing the full low end of the kick. So not only am I giving it a higher ratio, I'm allowing the side chain to hear all the sub frequencies. So what do you think is going to happen to the low end of the kick? <laughs> Damien, Damien kind of like, ah, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's basically how it went down. <laughs> All right, like, let's 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 try it. Let's listen. In theory, the low end should be altered, and and the compression should overreact to the low end, so we're getting more dynamic control happening in the low end. Okay. Notice that now the kick with and without the compression almost sounds like I shifted the pitch. Do 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 da 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 do 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 da 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 I am altering the pitch. It's almost like an octave jump. Do 
you guys hearing that? Could you do it again one more time? Sure. Try to listen to the resonant frequency, dominant resonant frequency, the tuning of the kick. You guys hear that pitch shift? And, and this kind of goes back to my setting too of I've, I've really altered the low end response um, to it, almost making it clickier. And especially since it sounds like I went up in pitch. So let's do a quick comparison of setting two and setting four. Setting four is making the kick thinner, go higher in pitch and brighter than even setting two, which was like the brighter, brightest setting I had done from all the other ones. You guys concur? Me, setting four sounds really full. Are you hearing the pitch shift though? Or is not are you not perceiving it that way? I mean, I can hear that there's like more top end in it for sure. And it sounds like I can hear a little bit of that pitch shift, but I feel like there's still a lot of low end in there. And it, to me it just sounds more full. All right. Here over here what I'm hearing is I'm not I, I hear more low end information on setting two that I'm hearing on setting three. What is everybody else hearing? I got a thumbs up from Gabriel. Okay, yeah, um, I get that. Because I definitely like yin and yang effect hear more top end on setting four than I do three. But I don't necessarily hear the loss of low end in setting four. I just hear addition of that top end so i've really made the top end on the kick dominate more than 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 the low end does which is making it sound higher in pitch in that sense right harmonic scale bringing up those octaves uh but it's still it's the the same low end is still there then on setting two that's how i perceive it okay I definitely good. hear like the low end's different on setting two, but I think overall the way that I perceive setting four is more full because so that now, top end and low end. Perfect. So now let's add the bass and I'll switch from setting two and setting four. I'll start on setting four. that easier to hear the difference now? Yeah. All right. So we have four compression settings and we've made the, the kick interact with the bass in four different ways. Everybody agree? Yeah, I agree. All right. Last setting, 
five. Everybody pay close attention. Here's four. Pay close attention to the difference on five. Here we go. Four. Five. Four. Five. What changed? There's a high pass filter. On the side chain, right? On the side chain, yeah. That's the only difference. And now let's see the significance of side chain compression, side chain alteration uh, within the compression uh, uh, performance. Okay. I'll switch between setting four and setting five kick by itself. Okay, what are you guys hearing? I hear like the, with the side chain one, I hear the transients of the kick more, like it sounds like it's punching more through the mix with the rest of the drums. That's the main thing I can tell. That sounds fair. Anybody else? Everybody agree with Damien? Let's add, let's do the same thing with the bass. pretty drastic change going back and forth just by engaging the, the high pass in the detection circuit, right? You guys agree or was that hard to hear the difference? Uh, can, can you play it one more time? Okay. If you don't mind. Sure. Just listen to the low end of the kick and how the low end of the kick interacts with the bass. Start on setting four. Okay. easier yeah damn <laughs> just doing that completely changes the placement of the kick where now the kick on setting five with a high pass completely dominates the bass the bass is just like in the in the background when the kick hits every time as soon as I, I remove the side chain filter on setting four, the kick goes up in height and the, all the low end of the bass becomes dominant. All the top end of, of the bass 
moves to the background. So every time the kick hits, that top end is the dominant thing and the bass just doesn't sound as driving down there. But it sounds fuller. With the side chain pass, that kick is front and center every time it hits. But notice that I'm not making it louder in the sense that I've turned it up. It's just how I've shaped the different frequencies, dynamically pushing those different frequency ranges forward and stretching the, the length of those frequencies to give that alteration, that dynamic change, that impact, that tonal shaping by using a dynamic control. Which the results of tonal shaping with a kick are very different than tonal shaping with an EQ. You guys agree? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, let's stop here. This kind of concludes at least the, the theory, theoretical part of explaining how compression works. I think I've made my point on you can tie in frequency response to the attack and the release. You guys kind of understand the importance of the side chain and how flexible you can make a compressor and how much you can get out of it, uh, out of just one single compressor, okay? It can completely alter an arrangement in a song, just one instrument at a time, okay? So let's stop here. Next class, we'll start right where we left off and then we'll, we'll do the same thing on the bass and then we'll go to the guitars and, and move up the chain. Cool? Cool, yeah, sounds awesome. Okay. Thank you. Take are, are care, you, guys. Are you, are you gonna, um, oh, are you gonna, uh, this was recorded, right? Are you, yes. Are you gonna